Yes. And who knows, maybe that'll happen in the future. So right now we have a jam packed 90 minutes with Stefan and Philip. We're waiting to see Philip join, um, who will be, there you are, hello. Um, we have several maintainers of the Flux and Flagger, Flagger projects that are in the CNCF. So please, um, we'll have 90 minutes with Philip and Stefan and um, ask every question you've ever wanted to ask. So take it away. Okay. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I'm uh, Stefan, uh, and I'm here with Philip. We are uh, two of the Flux maintainers group. Uh, and today we are going to give you a deep dive into various uh, uh, Flux features. Not all of them, because it's impossible to do it in two hours, but uh, some of them. Uh, for those of you who are uh, new to Flux, uh, let me give you a short overview of the Flux project. So uh, Flux started around six years ago uh, in WeWorks as a you know, way to simplify our continuous delivery on Kubernetes. Kubernetes was very young uh, back then. There were no custom resource definitions, no operators and, and stuff like that. So um, Flux version one, which uh, was uh, developed and still maintained, uh, was a simple tool that will synchronize your cluster state with a single Git repository. So you put all your uh, definitions in there. And once you set up Flux on the cluster, Flux will uh, try to get the cluster state in the same um, definition as the Git repo. That's the, the the whole idea behind GitOps. And what that brings you is that you don't have to connect to the cluster when you want to do an app deployment. Um, you can just push some modifications to Git and Flux running on the cluster will pull those from, from the Git repo. This means you don't have to expose your cluster uh, API to the outside world. You don't have to place uh, uh, kubeconfig secrets in your CI system and so on. Um, roughly two years ago, we started working on, on Flux version two, which is a composition of, of um, Kubernetes uh, API extensions called custom resource definitions. And we have, I think around 12 of those. And we also have created dedicated controllers for things like um, pulling, uh, uh, manifest from Git, um, reconciling uh, Helm releases, if you use Helm, uh, reconciling uh, customized overlays on your cluster. Uh, another thing that we have now built in into Flux are notifications. So we can issue events to Slack or Discord or whatever when something happens on the cluster. And we also have um, a way to automate um, you know, new versions of, of app releases into uh, clusters. So that's the Flux project. I put here the link of the, of the main repository is Flux CD Flux 2. So please open your browser now and click you know, star. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, a second project that we maintain inside the Flux organization is Flagger. Flagger, what it does, it decouples the, um, the deployment of an application from the release process. So if, if uh, Flux does the deployment, Flagger does the release, and how it does it is by looking at metrics, uh, routing traffic from one version to another, and determine if the new version um, behaves okay under your serv service level objectives. Uh, I have some diagrams here. So Flux in its new version can span across multiple uh, clusters. You can run it on a management cluster or you can run a Flux instance per cluster. Uh, and these Flux instances can um, synchronize your cluster state, your fleet state, uh, if you want, with uh, various sources. So Flux is moving beyond uh, Git and GitOps, uh, Flux can now synchronize um, 
uh, <clears throat> the desired state from an S3 bucket, from a Minio cluster, soon from, uh, from OCI repositories, of course, Helm repositories and Git itself. Um, and it, it kind of is, is a reactive system. You can, um, it, it issues events for everything it does and it can also receive events from outside, from CI or from a container registry or from a, from a Git provider uh, in order to uh, do its uh, job uh, uh, faster. Okay. Flagger, as I said, it works with various service meshes and uh, gateway providers. Um, the idea of, of Flagger is that when you have an ingress controller or a service mesh, Flagger can take advantage of those and route traffic between app versions. So basically, Flux will detect, oh, there is a new version uh, to deploy. It will apply that new version inside your cluster. Let's say uh, you change uh, on the container image tag of an application, then Flagger sees that change and instead of letting Kubernetes uh, roll out the deployment to all your users, uh, it's, it does a gradual uh, rollout uh, based on traffic. So it moves 1% of your traffic, then it looks at Prometheus and other um, monitoring systems, uh, checks if, if, um, if the new version behaves okay, and if it doesn't, it does an automatic rollback and allows you to fix it and, you know, um, uh, keep deploying without fear. So, you know, you can also deploy on Fridays. Okay, that was the overview. Uh, the agenda for today, I'll be talking about, I'll be giving you a status update on Flux. What are the latest and greatest uh, features? Uh, that we released uh, last week. Um, Philip will talk about managing Kubernetes jobs with Flux, uh, running database migrations and stuff like that. And then finally, I will uh, do a demo of observability for GitOps pipelines, where I'm going to uh, show you how I'm uh, structuring my repo, how I'm installing Prometheus, Loki, Grafana, how I can look at metrics and see what's happening inside my cluster and also with Flux. And finally, I'll, I'll give you a, a demo of with GitOps Core, which is an open source um, uh, offering for uh, Flux web UI. Okay, so uh, we have released Flux 031, which comes with, uh, let's say one of the, one of the future that was most requested in the last year, um, getting a Helm OCI support into Flux. Uh, what we currently offer uh, right now, if you install the latest version is you can use Flux to pull uh, charts from uh, OCI compatible container registries. So I don't think Docker Hub works for this uh, right now, but um, many other registries already have this support for OCI types. So Helm uh, uses a, um, a specialized uh, OCI artifact type that not all container registries understand. Uh, so Flux is able to, you know, connect to these container registries, find your Helm charts there, and how uh, how we are how we, we have shipped authentication right now is through either Kubernetes Docker secrets or um, basic authentication with username and password, and of course tokens for for GitHub uh, and other GitHub container registries and other um, other registries that support tokens. Um, what we want to do uh, in the future, we want to support OEDC authentication. So for example, you can use an IAM role binding for, for ECR, give the Flux uh, source controller service account um, access to your ECR um, repos, and Flux will automatically connect to it without having to set a static uh, authentication through Kubernetes secrets. And we want to do this across the board for AKS, GCP, EKS, and so on. We already have implemented all of this into image automation controller and image reflector controller. And we have to 
refactor a little bit our code and get that into source controller for Helm as well. Uh, other to do's here are, we currently don't support self-signed certificates. So when you host uh, your own container registry, let's say with, um, with the Docker distribution, you can generate a, a self-signed set, but currently Flux will not be able to connect to that container registry. Uh, we are we have opened a pull request on the Oras project, which is um, it's a project in CNCF, which um, abstracts away it's a library for uh, for working with OCI artifacts. And uh, Sule, uh, a member of our team, one of the Flux maintainers, have had opened a, a pull request there to add support for. Uh, passing uh, custom uh, TLS certificates to the, uh, uh, to the client. So we can get this in. And lastly, uh, we, we want to um, support dependencies inside charts. So when you build these umbrella charts, you can host an umbrella chart in your Git repo, right? So, Currently, what Flux does when it detects a, an umbrella chart in your Git repo, looks at its dependencies and goes to those um, Helm repo stories to fetch the dependencies. Now, um, you can add dependencies to uh, other Helm charts, which are hosted in OCI. So we need to figure out how to, how to extend the, um, the dependency resolver to OCI as well. And, this is uh, in the works. There is a draft pull request uh, for this task already. So I would say soon in the next month, we'll, uh, we'll solve all these issues and we'll fully ship um, Helm OCI support in Flux. How does this look? Um, I, I have here two Helm repository definitions. The first one is how you use you used to use Flux with uh, uh, with HTTPS uh, repos. So you give it the URL of your uh, HTTP uh, S uh, Helm repo story. Then you tell uh, you give Flux uh, um, a reference to a Kubernetes secrets which contains the basic authentication for it. And if you want to migrate from HTTPS Helm repo stories to um, container registries, the changes to your uh, Flux definitions are minimal. Um, what you have to do is specify a different type, OCI. Um, you have to give it a, a different secret. Um, the secret has to be a image pool secret this time uh, that contains the Docker authentication that can be generated with, uh, with, with kubectl very easily. And of course you give it the URL to your container registry. On the Helm release side, how you define Helm releases from charts and so on, nothing changes. Everything that used to work uh, until now for HTTPS Helm repos also works for container registries. So for example, if you want to automatically upgrade uh, a Helm release to the latest patch version, let's say you in production, you want to fully automate this and you want to say every time there is a patch version for a particular chart, I want Flux to uh, upgrade that, uh, that hand release. Um, this, this works uh, fine with, with OCI. What we do, we, we um, depending on the interval that you set, we talk to the OCI, the container registry API, we do, we list all the tags, and then we do a semver uh, filtering on those tags, ordering, and that's how we decide which is the latest stable version to be deployed uh, on a particular cluster. So why would you switch from HTTPS Helm repositories to OCI Helm repositories? Well, <clears throat> there, there are a couple of bottlenecks in the HTTPS Helm repository implementation. Um, the major one is the fact that, okay, you have to maintain your own HTTP server. Uh, you have to store all the charts in there, but you have to maintain this index file, which is a YAML file with all the chart versions 
uh, ever pushed to the repository. And this doesn't quite scale. Uh, if you look at what's, uh, what the Binami team did recently, so Binami maintains this, um, I think it's one of the most popular uh, ham repositories out there. Uh, it's free. Um, they, a couple of uh, days ago, they said, uh, we have terabytes of transfer just for our index YAML because it's huge. We have thousands and thousands of versions in there. So in order for them to reduce the traffic, they've deleted uh, I don't know, one third of the, uh, of the index file. So for example, if you were using a Redis chart from Bitnami, which is two months old or three months old, um, that chart is no longer available in the index. Uh, so yeah, that's, a, that's quite an issue. Uh, also from a Flux perspective, um, the more this index file grows, we have to download it every time to see if there is a new chat version. So if, you, if your hair repository has hundreds of applications with thousands of versions for each app, for each chat, we have to download all these huge files every time. We have to parse it, load it into memory, and so on, just to detect if there is a new version for a single application, right? So um, people um, see Flux source control using I don't know, one gigabyte of memory uh, while they have a single chart deployed. <laughs> well, if your index file is hundreds of megabytes, uh, we have to parse that, load into memory and so on, right? So, the fact that everything has to be stored in its index file is a huge bottleneck at scale. Uh, switching to uh, a container registry and uh, using that as your help repository uh, eliminates completely the index uh, YAML uh, problem. There is no more index YAML. Uh, we just uh, fetch the tags, as I said, for a particular chart. So we don't query all the charts everywhere, only the one that you want to update. And we don't have to store that file. We don't have to do anything about it, right? It's just an API call to the container registry. We find the latest version that you want to deploy. And then we download that particular chat. So if you are a Helm user and your organization uh, deploys hundreds of, of Helm releases and so on, I highly recommend you to look into uh, OCI and try to migrate from from HTTPS repositories to container registries. That's my, my current recommendation. Okay, next. Um, so we have adopted OCI for help, but what about all the other things like plain manifests, customized overlays, I don't know, Terraform configuration and so on. Um, we want to make Flux work with OCI as the source of truth for everything inside your cluster. So there is a RFC open, the a proposal on how we want to um, expand OCI support for everything that Flux does. And I, I've put the link here to the pull request. Please go there, um, uh, add your um, input, vote, thumbs up if you think this proposal uh, will, will help you. Uh, the idea behind it is that we want to introduce a new API type called OCI repository that looks like a Git repository with small modifications. Um, instead of doing the verification with OpenPGP, like we do it for, for Git commits, uh, for, for OCI artifacts, we want to do the verification with cosign and um, all the things should work the same. Like you can use uh, sample filtering, you can follow uh, a mutable tag. Like right now with Git, you follow a particular branch. Uh, when you use OCI, you can have for each branch in your repo uh, an OCI tag and you move uh, that uh, tag to, to different versions and so on. So that's the, the current proposal. What will change on the uh, Flux customized control and hand control side on the source ref, instead of having a Git repository, you'll be able to reference an OCI repository, but um, everything will work the same. It's just a different source. 
Uh, we also want to make uh, make easy for uh, for users to push OCI artifacts from plain manifest to container registries. So Flux the CLI will uh, offer two new commands. One is Flux push for a particular uh, you push a particular uh, repository content or a particular directory um, uh, to the container registry, and uh, Flux will do the bundling of, of the OCI artifact, the authentication, and the actual push. And uh, another command will be flux tag. So you can say uh, tag v100 as latest, right? If you want to follow uh, a particular uh, immutable tag. Okay, that was it around what we envision for flux and OCI. And the last thing I want to talk to you about what's, what's new in, in the latest flux release um someone contributed an external contributor um integrated flux with uh, github uh, repository dispatch api what this means is that you can build uh, um, promotion pipelines and you can for example um, set flux on the staging cluster to always um, install the latest available uh, helm chart uh, you can configure Flux on staging to run Helm tests and so on. When Flux um, uh, determines that, okay, this new char version is fine, the tests are running, the application is running on the staging cluster, it can send an event to GitHub. And inside GitHub, you can have a GitHub action which promotes that chart version from staging to production by doing a Git commit. And I'm going to show you later on how that looks like. Uh, we have uh, created the um, documentation page, especially for this. Um, the link it's, is here. It's on the Flux CDIO website. Okay, so those were the, the Flux uh, updates. Now I'm going to uh, leave uh, Philip explain how um, Kubernetes jobs can be managed with Flux. And I want to give a... Uh, um, you know, a heads up of uh, what Philip did in the Flux project and what he's currently involved to. If you are, for example, um, using Terraform to install Flux after you bootstrap your clusters with Terraform, well, Philip uh, created that uh, Flux Terraform provider. Uh, if you use Flux with Azure DevOps, well, Philip made that possible at the beginning for, for Flux version 2 con to connect to Azure DevOps repos. Uh, he helped a lot with, he came out with the idea of, of doing uh, status commits. So Flux can write back to GitHub, GitLab, Azure DevOps, and so on. And for a particular commit, it can, it can mark that commit if it was successfully reconciled or it failed on the cluster. So it adds observability to your repository. You don't have to look at dashboards or anything. Uh, Philip created that uh, first in, in Flux. So, Thank you very much, Philip, uh, for everything you did and what you are currently doing. Over and I will, I will probably make you even more sad with the things that I'm going to show you <laughs> in this presentation. I tend to always come up with interesting ideas, I guess, that you that not everybody agrees with, and then eventually, when you put it out there, you can't really like take it back. So I, I haven't, I haven't really, uh, I'll show you a bit in the end. Uh, so yeah, so uh, I'm just gonna talk about uh, managing Kubernetes jobs uh, with Flux and the challenges and different solutions that you, uh, well, can come up with. Uh, so historically Flux and job triggering uh, has been a challenge with literally every GitOps tool. Um, so within Kubernetes, a job resource represents a, um, a pod that is supposed to run to completion once, uh, when you create a new job in a Kubernetes cluster, it will, will spawn the new pod, but then it's done uh, to trigger the job. Again, you have to create a new job resource or delete the job and, uh, create it again, basically, uh, this obviously doesn't really work too well with the way that Flux is set up, where it will 
try to reconcile the resource and then, for example, if you commit a job today into a uh, repository that is reconciled to a cluster, it will create the job, the job will run, and then Flux will go, great, I'm done. Um, so there, there isn't really, at least initially, there hasn't been that great of a support for uh, running jobs uh, intermittently or, or for different types of events. Um, why this is interesting? Well, my background is really, I work with a lot of uh, developers who are Flux end users. Uh, and traditionally or historically, most of these developers have been .NET developers. So they've come from uh, the C-sharp world with uh, some sort of traditional continuous delivery pipeline. And I'm moving them over to, uh, or trying to get them to, to accept and to move over to using Flux instead of their traditional Azure DevOps, GitHub Actions, Spinnaker Solution, Jenkins, whatever it can be. Um, the first question or a, a very common question that I get when you introduce them to Flux is, well, where is my deploy hook? Um, it, it is a big challenge because a lot of development teams might have built very complex solutions around uh, like post-deployed jobs or pre-deployed jobs. And uh, the continuous delivery pipeline is so much more than just kubectl apply or uh, some sort of roll-up mechanism. Uh, so, and, and when you're working with these types of developers or, or introducing new people to, to Flux, uh, you can't really argue by saying, I'm taking away features that you have today. So you can't, it, it's very difficult to argue for Flux to say, Flux is great, it's a lot better than a whatever you're doing today, but you can't do this. Uh, so that, that's been one of those challenges for me uh, throughout maybe the last couple of, or the last year at least. Uh, yeah. So the types of jobs or workloads that, that works today or has worked uh, since forever really uh, within Flux has been cron jobs. So cron jobs as like uh, basically defines a, a cron tab or a, a schedule to run on. So that resource, when you apply it to Kubernetes, it will, uh, the, the, the cron job controller, when it sees that it matches the schedule, it will create a job which creates a pod. So that works totally fine. Uh, another thing that, that works uh, with the Helm controller is Helm hooks, uh, which seems to be the, the go-to solution for developers who want pre-deploy or post-deploy hooks within uh, while using Flux. Uh, so the Helm controller fully supports that. So it allows you to, for example, define uh, resources like a, a job or a pod that is created at different stages throughout the life cycle or the deployment life cycle uh, of a Helm chart. So these types of use cases already work today. Um, the issue with Helm hooks really is that you have to be a Helm user. So there, there isn't really an option there out there for you if you're not using Helm. So what types of potential use cases are there really out there for, for these types of um, tasks or, or, or pipelines or whatever you want to call them? Uh, the typical things that uh, I tend to hear is uh, questions around database migrations. Uh, so you might have your schema defined as code together with your application, uh, but you have to have some sort of consensus if you're running multiple replicas, uh, where one of the applications is supposed to do the um, actual schema migration, or you want to do the schema migration before your application start running and receiving traffic. Um, there are different types of use cases around post and pre-deploy jobs. So running something that makes a web request somewhere, or there might be some organization uh, rule around doing certain things beforehand. Or you want to run like uh, complex end-to-end -end testing solutions like Selenium or, or other types of tools that bash commands kind of don't really fit into there. Um, so there, there are like legitimate use cases where people uh, really want to have the, this type of feature. So in, in, the, in the context of database migrations, uh, generally what I see or what most people do is that they have a single image with an application uh, or the application logic and the schema migration tool or code or library or whatever they're using in the same image. Uh, a release might update two image tags. Uh, we'll get into that a bit later. Um, and what I've seen before is that most people, and I think even the, the official Kubernetes documentation talks about using init containers uh, to do this type of thing. 
Um, so the idea is that you have a deployment with an init container. Uh, it creates multiple replicas, and then the init container will run, do the actual database migration, and then the, the application will start after that. Um, this has a couple of downsides. Um, one of them is that you're actually forced to create the new replica set before you know that your schema migration has actually passed. Um, so that, that's, that's one of those challenges. The other one is that there are a lot of schema management tools, uh, for example, Entity Framework, uh, which is a .NET tool that uh, doesn't have built-in database uh, locking support. So you actually have to manage uh, to make sure that a you're only running the migration workload once. And in the, in the case of init containers, you have three replicas in an application that you're gonna start three init containers. Uh, and you have to then implement some, some other kind of consensus or database uh, locking mechanism to make this type of thing work. Uh, and what I'm gonna talk about now is the other option, which is to use two separate customizations. Uh, so the idea behind this is that you have two customization or flux customization resources. Uh, one of these customization resources has a the force flag set to true and waits for all resources to complete. Uh, and the only thing that it does is it deploys a job. Uh, that job will run some sort of migration, connect to the database, do the schema migration, all great. And the second customization is the one that's actually deploying your application, it's depending on the first customization and it will block until the first customization is completed. Um, the reason this works is because the customization is gonna wait for the job to complete and the customization is not gonna be marked as ready until the job is complete, which blocks the first customization to actually deploy. This is how it looks uh, in manifest form. So you have your database migration resource. Uh, it sets wait to true force, and it defines your database migration job. And then you have your second customization that depends on this, basically. Uh, we can have a show a quick demo of how this would work. Um, so let's do like this. So here we have a couple of uh, already run jobs and we have our deployment. So we have our deployment here and we have a job here. So in, the, in this kind of type of scenario, um, we have already run our job. So um, the job is run to completion and the, the pod is completed. Uh, if, if you were to deploy uh, the application with the job at the same time, um, you couldn't really update the job. So, but if we, look at uh, our database. We see that, yeah, it's a simple job. It runs an Alpine image, just simulating something. Uh, so a job within Kubernetes, um, the uh, parameters within the container are not mutable. So if you try to change it afterwards, uh, the Kubernetes API is gonna say that you can't really do that. Um, so this is why we've set the force flag to true. So let's simulate a some sort of schema change. So in a in a proper scenario, you'd probably update your image tag in your uh, your migration job and inside of your uh, deployment. So in this case, we're deploying Nginx just to have an example. But in in a, in a real world scenario, you'd have the same image in both the job and the deployment. You'd update the same image tag, but let's see what happens when we just change the sleep time in the job. So I'm just gonna make a commit of this change. Gonna push the changes, just gonna force a reconcile to get this done quicker. Uh, we can see that hopefully we have our customization. Uh, so the application is going to say dependency pre job migration is not updated yet. What we're going to see, 
hopefully soon. Oh, so what's happened here then is that uh, because this customization is set to force, so it ran a lot quicker than I expected, um, what it's done is it's deleted the job and it's recreated again. So that's why we're seeing a new trigger of this database migration. Uh, you probably don't want to do this with your uh, application customization because that would mean that it would actually delete the whole deployment if you'd make a change where Kubernetes wouldn't allow you to make that type of mutating change after creation. And if we check our customization, we see that, yeah, now it's applied. Uh, we could also do like this and say, for example, we exit with one, so the job is going to fail. And we do the same thing, same great commit message, reconcile our search kit. Uh, we see that we've started our database migration here. It's gonna, in a couple of seconds, fail. And we can now see that the, any changes to our application is not going to pass until this job fails. So this kind of assimilates a, a, a scenario where you have a database migration or, or some other kind of pre-deployment job that fails. Uh, so this job is just going to block any kind of progress for changes in this application. Um, so that kind of gives you the, the type of use case where we're using jobs in this sense. And it kind of solves the, at least the most basic use cases of I want to run something pre, or this even works as a, a, a post step. So you could flip this around, have the application deploy, have a separate customization that depends on the application with, with a single job and force set to true. And you could run this after a application is considered fully ready with health checks and everything. So this type of thing works both ways, basically. Uh, and I think that's this solves the majority of, of complaints that, that you hear today around job triggering and flux, really. Um, so Kubernetes jobs are um, slightly limited in the types of use cases that you can have. Um, for one, it is uh, individual jobs with containers that run, there's no ordering of the types of steps that you want to do. So you're stuck with a single image or, or building some sort of custom solution around this. Uh, and this is kind of where, where Tecton comes in. Uh, Tecton is a, another, I think it's a CNCF project. Don't quote me on that. Um, I hope it's great that this is recorded. So if I'm wrong, it's, it's yeah, oh, okay, it's not. I, I, I think I remember that it wasn't. Uh, so, but what it is, it's a Kubernetes native uh, CI CD framework. Um, it allows you to define more complex types of resources as um, within the KRM Amazing. solution or, or resource well, model uh, with tasks yeah. and pipelines. And you can have pipelines that reference multiple tasks and have them in specific orders and specific failure conditions. Uh, there are a bunch of different, very, very complicated things you can do with Tecton. So it can be as complex or as simple as you want to, uh, but it, it really solves the, this types of use cases where people want to do, well, more, more types of traditional continuous delivery solutions or systems within Kubernetes really. Uh, another thing that it can do is it can be triggered with webhooks uh, from event listeners. Uh, one issue with Tecton in its current state is that um, the way that we're doing, um, uh, the way that we're, we're health checking the job is that Q Flux has to be aware of the, the, the job that is created, uh, the difficulties around um, running Tecton today is that you, you have a task and a task run resource. So the task run resource is, a, is what's created once each task is supposed to run. Um, and Flux, ha having Flux detect specific tasks runs and understanding that the task run is supposed to complete is very or slightly difficult today. And there are, there are different types of solutions around this. So there is a, or it's a pretty old uh, post now, uh, two years ago or yeah, something like that by Kevin McDermott. Uh, I think he works at WeWorks now. At the time he did not. Uh, 
he posted early on a example where you could integrate a notification controller uh, together with a Tecton's event listener. Uh, so the solution that uh, he came up with or that, that you can come up with is that you have a alert that looks at, for example, a, in this case, a Git repository and a provider that is, um, I think it's called generic uh, Git provider. And the generic Git provider, what it does is it just posts a webhook with uh, the event source, so in this case, the Git repository. The event listener uh, is then configured with a trigger binding and a trigger template. What these types of things do is that they define, they, the trigger binding converts the input data to specific data that you then can pass into the pipeline. So you can pass in, uh, well, dynamic data into your, your, your pipeline configuration. Uh, and after this webhook is called, it spawns a pipeline run. Uh, very simple, or maybe not. Um, this, this works today. And I, I think that there are specific use cases where you actually want to do these types of things. Uh, the biggest issue is around uh, building these types of things is that it's, it's difficult to get health checking working where you, what you're interested in is, for example, the pipeline run completion. But the pipeline run in itself is going to be a resource with a dynamic name. So it's it's difficult getting, because Flux, the way Flux does health checking is very specific. It becomes very difficult to, to get it to, uh, well, dynamically point to the specific pipeline run and, and telling it that this has to complete. Uh, but but this is this is another option if you're looking into like doing event-based things where it's more of fire and forget. Uh, I highly recommend looking at at his blog post. Uh, it probably it, it goes through most of these uh, or explains how, how you implement uh, such a triggering system. Um, so we haven't really talked about Flagger that much, but uh, Flagger has uh, a uh, or within the Canary resource in Flagger, there is a concept called webhooks. Um, webhooks in uh, Flagger can be used to extend, for example, running um, Helm tests or starting load tests. It's for the most part originally meant to generate, or Stefan can probably correct me on this, but meant to generate load for applications that kind of don't have the amount of traffic uh, into the application to determine if a new rollout of the application is successful or not. So that, that's kind of the, 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 the initial uh, idea of these sets of things. But what webhooks allow you to do is that there are different types of webhooks that are called on at different stages during a, a canary progression where you could, for example, uh, in, in one case, the start gate, you would uh, this would be called before any work is done. And the HTTP request has to return a 200. If it's not returning a 200, uh, what ends up happening is that the uh, canary um, deployment is not even started. So there, there are different types of uh, scenarios where you want to roll, uh, use these types of things. Uh, most people use, I, I guess, use them for uh, generating uh, load, really, or load testing applications. Um, and this is the presentation that I'm calling, or the part of the presentation I'm calling, I am sorry, Stefan. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I just want to preempt this with uh, nothing that I'm going to show is open source yet. Uh, it, it's more of the things that I've been working on with uh, a customer that uh, I, I think is interesting, but it, it, I know and I'm aware that it misuses uh, some flagger functionality or it doesn't. We'll have to see. Uh, a lot of things I do tends to either or bite us in the ass in, in, in the end, and I tend to build things for people common. That was never meant to work in the first place. So I, I have a tendency of doing this. So just want to say, I'm sorry. You, you tend to build good things, and then I come with very interesting use cases. Uh, <laughs> the developers made me do it. That's what, my, that, that's what I'm saying. So what, one thing I, I missed there was that uh, Flagger has a uh, load tester. Uh, so as a part of enabling, uh, the type of work workloads or the, the type of webhooks here is that you're supposed to deploy your own load tester together with Flagger. Flagger then makes a, a webhook call and uh, the load tester has more functionality than just responding 200 where you can start Helm tests or you can run um, 
I think you know, there are a couple of different tools that you can run basically as part of the web hooks where it will, will start running functions and you can push in metadata. Uh, but what I haven't seen today, and, and that's kind of interesting, is the people build not building their own load testers. So because of the, the web hooks are, are very standardized and, and the type of data that you actually get from Flagger, uh, there's nothing really stopping you from, well, building your own and implementing more features uh, in this, and and I, I see this as a solution towards people working with, for example, wanting to extend the load tester and add more functionality and and come up with with new ideas. Uh, so, what you can do is you can build a, a load tester or a webhook that triggers Tecton. Uh, so this enables you to build very complex Tecton pipelines as a part of a pre rollout. So instead of depending on like Helm tests, for example, uh, you could build a, uh, and this part that spawns the task is not open source yet, but you might discuss if it should be. Uh, but as a pre-roll at stage, so in a pre-roll up, what happens is that the application or the new replica deployment is created and it's deployed, the pre-roll up webhook is called, uh, and you want to do something. You, you might want to start verifying or start running you know, some sort of test before you actually start shifting traffic over. Um, so what, what happens here is that we have our URL. This is just the service name uh, of a separate application. And you're passing in a some metadata, in this case, the task rep. Uh, and you have a task deployed. So this task is not going to run because it needs a task run resource to trigger the actual task. Uh, but what we're doing here is that we're saying the canary, we're referencing the name of this task. Um, and what we don't want to do, and, and this is obviously the most simple use case, but what we can do then is that we can get uh, we can get a nice solution where we trigger task runs. So if we look, for example, in we have our deployment here, and we say we make this super important change in pod info. And we say, let's just change the color here. So push the changes. Keep reconcile changes. We should probably, hopefully, see our canary. Uh, Hopefully see the canary, what, no? This is not, did I push my changes? Did I make him make the correct changes? Yeah. Let's let's do that again. All right, sorry. Let's make some other change. Um, I think it went through. <clears throat> it's just that Flagger does a bunch of stuff before it continues. Can you look at, at the canaries again? Oh, now it's running. Yeah, so, because a 10 seconds delay. Yeah, okay, yeah. So what we see now is that we are actually, in this case, we have a very quick task run. But what we see here is that as part of the canary, we're actually starting a task run. In this case, we're just sleeping pretty quickly. Uh, I have another example where we can trigger this, but it fails. So in this type of scenario, we can see that our canary is not going to progress, or it's uh, the webhook here is saying the pod for good uh, task run is supposed to run. Uh, and that's going to obviously pass through the canary. So, what we see in Flagger is that, uh, or sorry, let's look at the Flagger Tecton, the custom load uh, tester, is that we are getting post hooks or from the Flagger instance telling it that, OK, so what am I supposed to do? In this case, what we're doing is we're using the timeout functionality and, and waiting for 
the actual task run to complete before resetting is a 200, and this is good. So, and in another scenario, let's just reset hard and do uh, canary, change the canary to um, do run the, I think it's called bad. Yeah. Change the task. We can show that in this case, we're simulating then that you have this very complex Selenium job or, or whatever you're doing to, to validate that your application is actually being deployed. Uh, we just want to reconcile that. I'm not sure how uh, Flagger handles changes to the canary at the same time. Um, we can then do like this, make the actual changes to Bad. Yeah. So that's now going to the bad webhook. I'm guessing that it's going to, in the middle of the task run, it's not going to run because this was a pre check. So what we can do then is that we. It will restart everything yeah. because the, um, the deployment has changed. Exactly. So in this case, now we're going to do a new deployment, but we're, we're telling the canary that, oh, check the, the bad task run that if you want to see the bad task run, we can see that it's just exact same thing. It echoes hello world, but just echo, exits with one. So in this case, we expect it to fail. So I don't know how I'm doing in time, but this is like the last part of my presentation. Um, so the, the idea here is that we can build custom solutions to run other types of complex jobs. And this is kind of like the presentation is going through the, the, the different types of use cases or the different types of functionalities that you, you might want to look at when running jobs, basically. So at the simplest, you have the solution where you have two separate customizations that uh, one triggers the job, the other depends on it. That works pretty great, but it doesn't work with this types of use cases where you may want to deploy your job and then run complex solutions at the same time. Um, you could technically do this with Flux, but you'd have to solve health checking. Uh, so you could set up the, the, the solution that Kevin has with triggering with the event listener and then triggering a task run. But in those types of solutions, you'd have to have a way for Flux to know when the task run has failed. Uh, and that's kind of where, where that solution kind of got stuck. So this is another type of look at using Flagger together with Tekton in a way that might not have been the initial idea, but I think is a possible solution. And yeah, we see here that it failed. We can also see that it's giving a 500. So it's saying the task runner has failed. And we can then see that hopefully that the canary is stuck or should be stuck at least. It will uh, it will retry for however yeah. many times exactly. it's said it. <clears throat> yeah. So yeah, if it was Flagger has this toleration thresholds yeah. they can set. I mean, maybe the task failed once, but you want to restart it, yeah. and, and you can tell Flagger, hey, wait, wait a little bit, give it another chance. Yeah. Or you can say, if it fails once, roll everything back and stop it. And the benefit of using Tekton for these types of solutions is that because Tekton as a run um, result is stored in the Kubernetes API, no matter how many times the that flagger calls on your webhook to run this job, it won't rerun it. It's just going to check that, well, I get my hash of the, the last promoted uh, version, and it's going to recheck and see that, oh, I've run this task run and it failed. So no, here you go back 500. Uh, so that's kind of the type of solution that the current load tester, because it's all in memory, uh, this type of solution solves. So that, that that was my I am sorry moments to Stefan and then Stefan can run this great. solution. <laughs> <laughs> you always have to come with at least something, you know, a new and different. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was all from me. So 
Thank you very much. I hope you learned something about running jobs with Flux and Kubernetes. Thank over you very to much. You. Let's stop sharing here and again, go yeah, over. Go over. Okay, so next we are going to talk about Flux observability and how we build all sorts of things into Flux to make your GitOps pipeline observable. Um, one, one thing that Flux does today, and Philip uh, talked about this um, in his presentation, is health checking, right? So if, if Flux deploys something, it can also look after the things that it has deployed, and it can let you know if they are failing. And this works um, by the magic of a library called kStatus, which comes from Kubernetes, which is smart enough to detect um, uh, the readiness status, not only of um, Kubernetes native kinds like deployments, uh, jobs, cron jobs, uh, and so on, but also custom resources, which subscribe to um, uh, some particular um, conditions that they have set and, and case status, the library will look for that, right? So, um, those that build contain uh, build uh, Kubernetes custom resources, they if they implement the case state standard, then Flux can you know hold weight and report back uh, the status of a particular custom resource. Um, so that's that's one of the main features that we've added to Flux version two, um, and health checking works very great together with depends on what what Philip said, right? Where you can have this condition. So run this only if this other workload uh, was successful and, and and stuff like that. Um, going back to observability. We uh, publish everything that's happening with uh, in inside Flux as Kubernetes events, and you can do a kubectl get or kubectl describe for a particular Flux resource. Let's say you can do a um, kubectl get hand release, uh, I don't know, uh, Loki, and in there, if uh, in 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 the um, uh, in the events in the status of that custom resource, we report what we did last with it. Did we upgrade it? At what version? If it failed, why it failed, and so on. And uh, as I said, we, we issue these Kubernetes events for everything that Flux does. So if you have an event sync, you can uh, take those events and forward them to, I don't know, um, CloudWatch or Elasticsearch or, or whatever. And we do the same thing with, with logging. We um, uh, All the Flux controllers uh, are uh, logging in a structured format in JSON. Uh, so you can detect errors, uh, you can detect um, the time it takes for, uh, for a thing to happen and, and so on. And we, um, we are going to make a breaking change in the, in the future Flux release around our structured logging. We are, um, Kubernetes recently also got JSON structured logging um, into Kubelet, KubeAPI and, and those controllers. And we are going to align with how Kubernetes, what are the Kubernetes tags uh, that uh, it uses for logs. So we are going to change a little bit our, our logging structure to align, align with Kubernetes. But I think it's all for the best. Uh, you can have a, a log query that works for, uh, for a Kubernetes native controller, but also for Flux in the same way. Um, another thing, we have instrumented our controllers with uh, Prometheus uh, and we expose Prometheus metrics and you can build uh, um, uh, alerts uh, based on those metrics using Prometheus Alert Manager. And in our documentation, we have examples on how you can get alerted when something fails and so on. Um, <clears throat> we also uh, provide Grafana dashboards uh, for, for the flag things, and I'm going to show uh, those to you. Um, next, um, Flux also comes with a controller, which is called notification controller, which can, um, it listens to the Flux Kubernetes events and can forward them to Slack, Microsoft Teams, Discord, Google Chat, Sentry, 
um, uh, uh, message keying systems and so on. This is this um, uh, small component of Flux has took over from a, a external contributors perspective. A lot of people have added over time new integrations and so on. Um, it's is different from Alert Manager in many ways. For example, with Alert Manager, you know, you get a notification when something fails, right? Based on some metric, some uh, number. But why it fails, you have to look into your Kubernetes cluster, tail the logs or whatever, right? Flux notification controller captures the error stack that Flux uh, um, sends and it sends that to Slack, Microsoft Team, Discord, whatever, whatever. So in your Slack channel, you'll actually see, oh, this hand release failed, and also the error in there in the same message. So that's why uh, we build notification control and we couldn't just rely on uh, Prometheus Alert Manager. There are two different things uh, made for, for different purposes. And finally, um, part of, the, of our observability story is the commit status uh, uh, update. What that means is that every time you do a git commit, Flux will do whatever it needs to do based on the changes that you made to the repo. And then Flux notification control can write back to your git repo story uh, and update the, uh, the commit status with the result of what happened on the cluster. So you get uh, instant feedback. If something failed, uh, you can see there in GitHub, GitLab, Azure DevOps, Bitbucket in, in their UI. And I want to give you a, an overview of how to set up um, um, Prometheus stack and Loki. So we have here um, a guide on, on the docs website on how to um, uh, set up monitoring with Prometheus and how to set up um, a log aggregation with, with Loki stack and how to install the dashboards and so on. So what I, what I did was I created uh, um, a private repo with Flux Bootstrap GitHub. Then I've uh, added to this repo uh, a monitoring stack for, for my cluster. Now I'm going to walk you through a little bit inside the repo and see how I'm setting this up. So <clears throat> I've bootstrapped Flux on this path cluster base. This means in here, there is a Flux system directory with all the Flux components, right? If you want to keep Flux up to date, you can use the Flux GitHub action that will update the, the components every time there is a new release and so on. So you can fully have Flux up to date without uh, you know, applying things on the cluster directly. Flux knows how to update itself and so on. So, okay, I, I've set up Flux uh, for, uh, for this path. It synchronizes everything in, in this uh, base directory. And here I have a, a thing called the monitoring YAML, which are, um, which are two Flux customizations, which are applying things from inside this repo in a particular order. And what I'm doing here, I've defined in my directory add-ons monitoring, I have I have two groups of, of manifests that um, make my monitoring stack. One group is the monitoring controllers and we'll, we'll see what's in there. And the other group is my monitoring configuration. And the configuration depends on the controllers. So first I'm installing the controllers and all their custom resource definitions. And then in, after that succeeded, then Flux will install on this cluster uh, the monitoring configuration, which are Prometheus operator custom resources and, and other things like that. So let's look um, inside add-ons monitoring and see what we have here. So in the monitoring directory, I have, as I said, controllers and configuration. Let's look at controllers. And inside controllers, I have, for example, a uh, hand release that um, deploys uh, the Cube Prometheus stack um, chart inside my cluster. And this sets up Prometheus, Prometheus operator, uh, exporters for core DNS, Cube uh, API, and so on. And it also configures 
uh, a Grafana instance that watches for config maps that can store other Grafana dashboards. So this is all set up through this um, Helm chart, which is maintained by the Prometheus community. Then inside my uh, configuration directory, I have, for example, the I have here my JSONs, JSON file with Grafana dashboards. How can I get these JSON files to actually be loaded into Grafana and have all my Flux dashboards in there? Well, I'm using the customize here with a config map generator and I'm telling customize, hey, look at all these JSON files um, and make from all of them a config map. And what's important here, I'm also telling customize, when you create this config map, add this label to it, Grafana dashboard one, which tells the Grafana sidecar, hey, this is a config map, which actually, actually contains dashboards. So you have to load it uh, in, in real time into, into Grafana. It doesn't have to restart Grafana or anything like that. So this is how I'm setting up my, uh, my custom flag, flux dashboards. And this is already running on my cluster. Let's look at monitoring. So if I do flux get all from monitoring, let's see what we have deployed in here. So we have all these charts <clears throat> and hand releases. And I have this cube Prometheus stack the Kubernetes dashboard, the Loki stack, some other UIs. And I also have uh, specific Flux objects for, for Grafana. I'm going to show you right away. But if we look in the monitoring um, namespace for config maps, we'll see here, uh, config map named Flux Loki dashboards and another one Flux Grafana dashboards. And here is uh, the checksum of the files in my Git repo. So every time I'm, I'm changing something in my uh, dashboard definitions, when Flux will rebuild the config maps, it will generate a new config map name, right? So I'm treating these uh, config maps as immutable. So it, with every change, Flux create a new config map. Then Flux also patches the Helm release that uh, uses these config maps and triggers an update of that. So, and at the end, it also deletes the old config maps, right? Through garbage collection. So uh, this is how I'm, uh, I'm making sure that any change to my, uh, my config maps are, are um, reflected in the cluster as unique objects. So let's see these dashboards and what they do. Um, one dashboard is um, showing the Flux control plane, um, all the controllers, how they are doing, CPU usage, memory usage, uh, how many API requests they make to the Kubernetes API. And I recommend a lot this uh, <clears throat> dashboard uh, when you deploy Flux at scale, when you have hundreds of hundreds of Helm releases and customizations and Git repositories and so on, you have to be careful and monitor how many Kubernetes API calls Flux is making because Kubernetes API has a rate limiter, right? To not get overwhelmed, a Kubernetes API will rate limit Flux if it does thousands of thousands of calls. We are uh, very careful what how we uh, how we perform these calls. We we use caching for all our get uh, operations and so on. But you know this is one way uh, of seeing uh, how many objects you have. Maybe you've set the customization interval to I don't know a minute or a couple of seconds, and you know you are basically ddosing your your Kubernetes API without even knowing. So so this, this dashboard is, is is great for that. It also gives you an overview of you know um, what what things uh, how many resources Flux is using, 
If you have huge uh, Henry Foy studies index files, you'll see here that source controller uses uh, gigabytes of memory instead of 10, 20 megabytes like it should use normally. So if we look here at source controller, um, this is his memory, it's like nothing. Uh, Flux is meant to be run on edge devices, on uh, Raspberry Pis and so on. So we, we made Flux use as little uh, resources as possible, but Flux is very influenced about what you have in your sources, right? How, how large are the Git repos? How large is the Git uh, history? Helm, uh, the size of the Helm charts and so on can influence um, Flux resources. Okay, so this is one dashboard. You also can see timings, how much it takes to reconcile each Helm release. Uh, how many operations is doing and so on. <clears throat> uh, second dashboard is called uh, cluster uh, stats. And here is all about uh, having a, an insight into Flux custom resources and their statuses, right? Uh, we have here uh, uh, the average duration of, of each type, like, okay, for reconciling all the ham releases in, in my cluster, the average duration is uh, half a second for customization is larger is, is close to one second and a half. Uh, why is this happening? Why are always customization more expensive in terms of, of, of um, time than Helm releases is because Flux is able to undo any kubectl edits on the cluster. So if you connect to a cluster uh, outside of GitOps, outside of Git, and you start editing random uh, objects that are controlled by Flux. What Flux and the customized controller does, it continuously monitors your, uh, your cluster state. And when it detects a drift, oh, you change this container image, but in the source, it's a different version uh, of that uh, container. It will automatically undo that change. So in order for Flux to detect drift, it needs to do a server-side applied dry run. So, Depending on the interval that you've set in your Flux customization, what Flux will do will, will ask the Kubernetes API, hey, for all these objects, are any changes inside ETCD? And Kubernetes will respond, oh, this object has changed. OK, so Flux will actually apply that object, uh, undoing all, all, all the manual changes. So that's why um, uh, customized controller is it's more heavy than, than helm controller. And we, we also want to, uh, to solve the, uh, the drift detection for helm charts as well, for helm releases. A lot of people are saying, hey, I'm going, uh, I'm doing a kubectl delete of some deployment, which is part of the helm release. Why, uh, why isn't Flux recreating it? Well, because we in, 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 Flux, in the Flux Helm integration, we look at the Helm storage, not the actual, not the actual objects which are, which are there in, in the cluster. If you do a Helm upgrade, we can, we roll back that immediately. But if you change objects which are created from Helm, we have no knowledge of those. And this is what we are working on next is uh, detecting all the things that come from a Helm chart and uh, doing a, a similar dry run uh, um, action and detect changes and uh, undo it. Okay, so this dashboard shows you, you know, um, errors. If if you have Git repositories or or any kind of source that is failing, and here are tables with which one is failing. What you will not be able to uh, see from this dashboard is why it fails, right? These are Prometheus metrics. You only see that they are failing or not. Um, if you want to see why it fails, then you have to look at, oops, let's see, too many outstanding requests. Yes, I have this problem with Loki. I haven't figured out what's going on, uh, but it will recover. Okay. So if you really want to know what happens, uh, inside the cluster with, with, the, with, with this solution is, first you'll see here, okay, something failed. Then you have to go here. Um, this is a dashboard uh, built on top of, of the lock, uh, Grafana Loki data source. 
and is particularly made for flux, it filters by um, the flux output and so on. So here you can search for your application that is failing. You put the name here and in here, you will see the actual reason why it's failing and so on, uh, looking at the logs. And if you are using um, um, the, uh, this Helm chart, the Cube Prometheus stack uh, Helm chart, it comes with a bunch of other uh, Grafana dashboards for monitoring Kubernetes in general, not only Flux. So you can see deployments, status, pods, and so on. And here is uh, how Flux is doing. I'm filtering uh, only the workloads in the Flux system namespace. And I don't know, let's look last 15 minutes. I'm reconciling a bunch of apps in, inside here. It should be some activity. Um, yeah, not, not much is happening. Um, Flux is quite quite easy on CPU usage. From time to time when it, when it does something, you no, know, it uses something like zero, 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 zero something from a CPU. So yeah, I wanted to share this to uh, showcase that, you know, Flux is very, very light compared to its competitors on your cluster. Okay, so this is one solution on how you can, you know, drill down into Flux and find issues and, you know, eventually debug the problem by looking at the logs. Now, uh, uh, another um, uh, another solution to this is instead of using any kind of dashboards or any kind of UI, you can, of course, use the Flux CLI, which gives you an insight into everything that's happening. It also, it can also um, print all the logs. Uh, you can filter the logs based on um, uh, things like uh, custom resource definition names. You can only print the logs of the customization for a particular name in a particular namespace. You can follow logs, you can filter logs based on errors and so on. So this is the, the CLI, CLI experience, right? For, I don't know, Linux uh, people which are <clears throat> uh, love CLIs, this is, this is the best way to, you know, dig and debug flux. But all about all the other users that, <clears throat> you know, they want a user interface and especially a, a web user interface. Well, for this, there is a nice, great, awesome open source project made by um, WeWorks, the company I work for, and it's called with GitOps Score. Uh, it's an open source um, web UI made especially for Flux. There is also a paid version of this. We have to, you know, <laughs> sustain Flux development somehow. We are, I think, around 10 people working full-time from WeWorks on Flux. So yeah, um, uh, someone has to pay for all, all of that. And um, there is, as I said, with GitOps Core, which is the open source uh, UI for Flux. And it's also with GitOps Enterprise, which is the paid version, which comes with uh, cluster API integration, multi-cluster deployments, and a lot of of, of nice things when you run Flux at scale. And I'm going to show you how easy it is to deploy uh, with GitOps Core uh, on a cluster. Going back here in my repo at add-ons, I have a directory called with GitOps here. And with GitOps, the UI is published as a hand chart. So I can define a repository coming from WeWorks. Then here is the actual release. Um, and I'm setting here all sorts of values. I'm creating an admin user and I'm setting here um, the bcrypt uh, hash of, of my password. So let's, let's look at how this is. This is the login um, uh, interface. You have two options here for testing. You can do it like I did. You can hard code an admin username and password in your hand release, or you can use DEX and uh, log in with an OEDC provider. For example, you can 
um, log in with your GitHub credentials and allow your GitHub teams uh, to view some cluster uh, by logging in directly into with GitOps with their um, um, using GitHub authentication. Uh, going to login as admin, now ADC set up, and let's see what with GitOps shows me. So there are um, two views here. One are applications, which are a generic thing. There is no application in Flux. Uh, there are customization, there are hand releases, there are all sorts of things, but you can make those into, you can use these low level um, concepts to you know, create your own application idea. So that's why everything here in terms of any kind of object that uh, reconciles something on the cluster will be listed here under applications. And we also have sources. And here you can see all your Git repos, Helm charts, Helm repositories, and, and so on. Um, I have deployed the demo um, app, which is, let me see here. I created recently this uh, repo, which is called microservices demo. It's very different from the WeWorks microservices demo or Google microservices demo and so on. Um, <clears throat> it's specifically made for Flux. Each microservice is um, controlled through a Flux customization. And um, the actual instance is a, a tiny uh, app I made in Go, which is uh, a very light in terms of resource uses. So we can run um, 20 Kubernetes deployments, which are making the whole uh, microservices demo with just 300 uh, megabytes of memory. And it works on Raspberry Pis, it works on Graviton2 and so on, because like Flux, uh, all these containers are, are multi-arch. Okay, so I'm, I have deployed, I have used this repo, the microservices demo, and I have, I have a reference to it from my own uh, cluster repo. So if we go back to my cluster repo here, okay, I'm going back here. I have in my cluster base, I have this microservices demo where I'm defining a Git repository that points to where all my microservices are defined and a customization that bundles all the, all the microservices into an app, right? So here is how you can, uh, you can build apps with, with, uh, with Flux uh, custom resources. And here inside my app, I can do all sorts of things. I can change a particular microservice or I can update a particular image and so on. And all my apps are running in a service mesh because yes, I want to use Flagger for continuous delivery and so on. Um, if we look here at microservices demo, let's see how this looks like. Okay, this is, let me go to applications, MS demo. Okay, so this is the top uh, object that contains my app, which is made of all these microservices. So let's see how we can, you know, visualize that in WikiTops. So we have this customization, it goes to my default class that has this source and it has this revision. Now, if I click on it, it will bring me to this details page where in here, I can see all the other uh, Flux objects that are you know reconciled on this cluster by this one. And I have here all my microservices, admin, advert, authentication, front end, and so on. Now, if I'm if I want to drill down in a particular microservice, let's look at the front end. I see with GitOps shows me all the things that were reconciled from, from this customization. Deployments, replica sets, pods. I can also see the version uh, of each uh, container image. I see my linkerd proxy. I see my app, which version is, and so on. Also, I can see all the Flux events for, for this particular app. So any kind of errors or any, anything like that, you'll, you'll see it in here. You also have graphs where you, um, you see how 
from which source a particular application originates in. So here is my Git repository. This one is used by the demo front-end customization and the customization, what it did on the cluster, it created uh, deployment, replica sets, pods, and so on, right? Then you can fully drill down into what's happening. If you are doing an update of, an, of a particular application here, you'll see in real time if it works, if it fails, why it fails, and so on, right? So with GitOps tries to give you that insight, visual insight, if you, you know, you don't want to deal with, uh, with CLIs and Grafana dashboards. Uh, another nice feature of this is the fact that it gives you the YAML definition of a Flux object, but not the one you have in Git, it's the one that it's in the cluster. So you actually have access to all the conditions. You see the Flux inventory, which objects Flux uh, uh, controls. And you also see how Flux does the service supply, which fields Flux manages, which other fields, other controller, controllers are managing like uh, horizontal pod auto scaler and so on. So it's, this is really nice for debugging because yeah, you don't have to do uh, QCAT or get and, and look in there, you have all of this here in the, in the web UI. And it's, um, this project is early on. There are many, many more things coming to the, uh, with GitOps UI, like, you know, showing, oh, this uh, Helm chart is from OCI, this version and so on. So you, um, WeWorks is, is, is improving the, the way we are by the day. I'm very, very excited about it. Even if I'm not a UI user, I use Git and the CLI with Flux. Okay, that was it. I went over time, like always, but it was, it, it was great uh, showing finally a UI for Flux. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, seeing the awesome comments on the Slack. Uh, thank you to Philip and Stefan for this. Um, and uh, if you joined us yesterday, then hopefully you know the drill. Um, we'll just shift over to the Slack channel where we've noticed people um, filling it up with questions and conversations and um, we will have our speakers there and um, we'll continue to do that. So like if you're watching a recording late, um, we'll just ping the speakers if anything comes up and they don't notice it. So thanks again to Philip and Stefan. Always fantastic. Uh, always learn a lot. And uh, yeah, we'll see you on Slack. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks for joining us late. <laughs>